uh, exciting symposium. And um, as I'm sitting here among our orthopedic surgeons, uh, I feel a little bit out of place, but I also have to remember uh, it's, uh, it's the heart that gives blood to all these joints and keeps everything going. So uh, it's important for, uh, for us to have a good understanding of the cardiac aspects of uh, sports. Uh, we'll uh, cover today uh, some objectives. And what I'd like to uh, discuss today are some statistics related to sudden death in, in athletes, causes of sudden death, uh, screening, and uh, the pre participation screening exam. Uh, what happens if an athlete is determined to have some cardiac abnormality or some symptoms of possible cardiac disease, and what are the eligibility recommendations regarding that, and then a discussion in the end about commotio cortis. And it's interesting that my interest in sports cardiology began uh, with uh, working with the Boston Celtics, and also it's, it's, it's Quite amazing that uh, my interest began with uh, the athlete uh, Reggie Lewis, who is one of the most famous graduates of Northeastern University. He is considered one of the finest athletes ever to graduate from this uh, university. Uh, he graduated approximately 1987 and was with the Celtics until 1983, where unfortunately he died suddenly. Uh, his, uh, his situation was uh, he was in. Uh, Uh, ben Borton Garden, and this is a photo taken from Sports Illustrated of him going down uh, during a near syncopal syncopal episode. He had two of these while competing. Uh, he subsequently was worked up and actually was found to have an abnormal heart condition, uh, a focal cardiomyopathy, uh, the entire front wall of the heart was scarred. And associated with that was the, that there was an irregular heartbeat. Uh, he uh, sought a second opinion, uh, and there was a question of whether he could return to sport later on. But unfortunately, uh, before he returned to sport, he actually just went out and practiced at Brandeis University, which was the Boston Celtics practice arena. He was essentially practicing by himself and actually went down in cardiac arrest and could not be resuscitated. So unfortunately, here is a 27-year-old athlete. At the peak of his game, he was the captain of the Boston Celtics and unfortunately died suddenly of a cardiac event. The, the other thing that, um, that is uh, amazing about these athletes who have cardiac disease is that they can look very healthy. Uh, so you can't judge a book by its cover. Uh, they could be the most healthiest looking athletes who look like they're in the best of shape, but they in fact can have underlying heart disease. And trying to identify those athletes are uh, a major effort in the pre-screening process. This uh, is a uh, photo uh, of Hank Gathers, who was a Division I NCAA player and uh, Loyola Marymount in California. And this was on national TV. He had a known irregular heartbeat and probably a uh, cardiomyopathy, a slightly weak heart, and uh, was on medication. Uh, during uh, a game on national TV, he went down uh, and became unconscious. And here he is being wheeled off the floor by his uh, team physician, his, his uh, teammates and probably the athletic trainers. And I'll come back to this slide because I think it's an important slide as we discuss things further. This is uh, another athlete who died more recently, Thomas Herion, who was a San Francisco 49 offensive lineman, who died after a uh, game, um, and uh, just immediately after a game. So again, healthy individuals who look uh, like in absolute perfect fitness and going down with sudden death related to sport. So let's define what we mean by sudden cardiac death. Well, it's an abrupt, unexpected death. It's a cardiac etiology. There's a loss of consciousness, and it usually occurs within one hour of the onset of symptoms. So usually cardiac related. Just moving on to statistics, it's a very rare event. About 100,000 to 100, 1 in 300,000 
high school and college age athletes. About 50 of these occur per year in the United States, and there's a 10 to 1 male to female ratio. It is more likely happens in a black uh, athlete than a white athlete, and uh, different sports have uh, different incidents. And as you can see here in the slide, uh, that uh, basketball, uh, football, and track have the highest incidence, uh, probably due to two factors. They probably have the most participants, and secondly, they have the most intense exercise for the sport. Uh, but also, uh, sudden death can be seen in these other uh, athletic events. As far as age of uh, occurrence, uh, most occur uh, in high school, uh, with some occurring in college, and uh, a few occurring before high school and at the professional level. We think at the professional level, the athletes are usually pretty well screened uh, and um, have been weeded out if they have any underlying cardiac condition. Where does it happen? Well, most of the time it happens in the practice because that's where the most of the time where uh, the athletes are un undergoing significant physical activity. Uh, less so in competition, in fact, uh, between competition, between practice, uh, there has an incidence of sudden death. A little more about the, about the statistics. Jarvis, uh, there's one death in every 396,000 hours of, of running. And one death in every 15,000 joggers. And if we look at the boards in marathon or any marathon, it's about one in 50,000 uh, marathoners who die. And if you look back at the centennial the marathon here, I think there was a death. Uh, with, and then at that event, they had approximately 50,000 marathon runners. This is the worrisome part, is that most athletes do not have symptoms before the event. And so in this statistic here, 82% had no uh, symptoms and 18% with symptoms. Now, if we look at how do we categorize uh, the uh, athletes uh, by age group, uh, it, 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 it's somewhat revealing. Um, I'm not going to really discuss children, uh, but we'll be focusing more on adolescent athletes and young athletes under age 35, and then the adult athletes over 35. Okay, and we can break them down into different uh, disease groups that are the common causes of sudden death. And if you look at the uh, incidence of sudden death over age, it definitely goes up as one gets older. There's sort of this low-grade incidence in, in the general population of sudden death up until age 30, 35, and then it suddenly takes off and becomes increasingly significant as one gets older. But let's look at the common causes of sudden death in athletes in just general terms. And if we look at the younger athletes, it's because of congenital heart disease. If we look at the older athletes, it's because of coronary artery disease, blockages within the coronary arteries. And then across the spectrum are the cardiomyopathies. So these are uh, heart muscle abnormalities, either related to weak hearts or hypertrophic hearts, picking heart muscles. Now, just focusing on uh, those athletes uh, who die under age 35, um, we can break it down and look at the causes. Uh, and the causes in the under 35 group is totally different than the causes over 35. And under 35, as I had mentioned, are really congenital heart-related disease. And by far, uh, the majority of these um, deaths are related to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, there is, a, again, about another 8% uh, related to probable hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. A significant percent is related to anomalies related to the coronary arteries. And then you get each of these have sort of a low grade incidence, but they're significant. Uh, myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle, probably related to a viral illness. Arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia uh, has, in this country, sort of a low-grade incidence of sudden death. In countries such as Italy, especially the Veneto area of Italy, there's a very high incidence there. There, there appears to be some relationship to 
mitral valve prolapse. Tunnel LAD means a, uh, the left anterior descending coronary artery is actually tunneled within the muscle, so when the heart contracts, the, the artery itself gets squeezed, and so not at, inadequate blood flow is occurring at the time of exercise. There's a small incidence of garden variety coronary artery disease that we see in the, low, uh, in the older population. Valvular heart disease, such as aortic stenosis, dilated cardiomyopathies that's in large parts, a ruptured aorta is the type we see with Marfan syndrome. And uh, ion channelopathies are congenital heart disease related to uh, electrical disturbances within the conduction system, which is uh, handed down in the family. Uh, and then there's this uh, uh, just an incidence of some, some incidence of with, when at autopsy that the heart is totally normal. So let's talk about some of the major causes. Um, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, just, uh, this is a transection of the heart. And uh, we're looking at here is the left ventricle here and the heart muscle. And this is very abnormal in appearance in that the heart muscle is markedly thickened. And here the intraventricular septum is markedly enlarged and the left ventricular cavity itself is small. And what happens with exercise is that the left ventricular cavity filling is, is small and that the ejection of blood uh, from the heart becomes obstructed so that there's inadequate uh, blood flow out of the heart to perfuse all this heart muscle. And because there's inadequate perfusion, it leads to electrical instability uh, and sudden death. Again, related to all the poor blood flow. This is the microscopic architecture of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and these are muscle fibers, and they should be lining up as bands in straight lines in parallel. And here you see this chaotic sort of uh, architecture that is seen with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is an autosomal dominant disease, so that family members can have this disease and often do have this disease, and so that's why obtaining a family history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or of sudden death at a young age is extremely important. This is an unusual disease in the United States, and as I mentioned, it occurs more often in Italy, and this is a rhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. And if we look at these cross sections here, this is the left ventricle here, the right ventricle here, the septum here. You can see this whitey appearance uh, of the, uh, the uh, heart tissue where this should be muscle, it should be thin tissue like this. And in fact, what it is is fat. And it's just fatty infiltration of the heart. We have no idea why this occurs, but it does occur. And when this does occur, it sets up an athlete for arrhythmia and sudden death from the arrhythmia. So it has to be uh, something that we have to keep in mind as far as evaluating patients and athletes who have arrhythmias during sport. Again, this is a microscopic slide of the uh, a patient with uh, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia showing instead of heart muscles here, we're just seeing fatty tissue infiltration. This is a cartoon showing uh, some of the anatomical uh, differences in uh, what we call anomalous coronary arteries. Normally, the um, heart has uh, three major coronary arteries, but two of them arise in different areas. Uh, the left main coronary artery, this is the aorta here. Uh, this is uh, the uh, left leaflet here of the aortic valve. And just in, in this sinus here, is usually the origin of the left coronary artery. And here it, um, in this in this area would be the origin of the right coronary artery. But there can be an anomalous takeoff of either the left or the right. And anomalous right coronary artery, the right coronary artery takes off from the left cusp and traverses between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And what we think happens is at rest is there is adequate blood flow because the ostium is, uh, is uh, slightly elongated but has adequate patency. But under stress, when the aorta dilates, the pulmonary artery dilates, it gets some torsion on, on the uh, anomalous coronary artery so that the ostium is narrow and therefore poor blood flow, poor blood flow sets up for 
ischemia. Ischemia sets up for irregular heartbeat and then sudden death. And then uh, as far as the anomalous left coronary artery, the same type of situation where this is the right coronary artery coming off normal. The left coronary artery from on the right cuff traverses between the aortic and pulmonary artery. And again, there can be torsion, narrowing of the ostium, poor blood flow, and possible sudden death. So let's look at the, uh, the cause of death in acid silver claw, uh, 35. And by far and away, the cause is coronary artery disease. The standard garden variety coronary artery disease we see in the adult population. With a small amount, maybe 10% of all those other diseases that we saw under 35. So different populations. So how does sudden death happen? And I have already just alluded to it, but let's go over that. We have, it requires a substrate, and then a trigger, and then it results in sudden death. The substrate has to be underlying heart disease. The trigger is the ex is exercise, putting some strain on the heart, and setting up for electrical instability and sudden death. So let's take an example of, of coronary artery disease. And if we look to, at another cartoon of drawing the heart, uh, we would look at the coronary arteries, the epicardial arteries, in branching out like roots of a tree, supplying heart muscle with blood flow and oxygen <coughs> and nutrients for the heart muscle to work. In coronary artery disease, we're looking at the uh, buildup of plaque, which is a cholesterol plaque, that actually has a more complex appearance. And in this drawing here, you can see that the, the cholesterol plaque is made up of a lipid core, a fibrin cap, smooth muscle cells, and, and actually can have inflammatory muscle, and this is a new theory of, of, of coronary artery disease, of, of having inflammatory muscle, uh, cells that weaken the cap, and therefore, under, under stress and surgery, situations such as exercise, the cap can rupture. With the rupturing of the, plaque, uh, the cap, uh, platelets can form. On top of that, blood clots, thrombus can form, including the artery, and causing poor blood flow and sudden death. So again, what's required for um, a sudden death event? Uh, physical exercise plus heart disease, and in these cases, the transient reduces flow, and in some cases, it can be uh, in, in, in those patients who have congenital um, conduction diseases, like the ion channel diseases, like long QT syndrome, uh, they can set up for fatal arrhythmia and sudden death. So let's talk about the pre-participation examination because it's designed to screen for athletes who may have underlying uh, heart disease. And I'm focusing really on the pre-participation cardiac exam. So let's look at the American Heart Association statement, uh, uh, which is uh, looks at cardiovascular peak participation screening of competitive athletes. And they recommend a complete and careful personal and family history and physical examination to identify those cardiovascular lesions known to cause sudden death or progression of disease. That is mandatory. It's before participation in organized high school or college sports, and then screening should be done every two years. Interim history should be taken at least once a year. For the older athletes, the master athletes, and that I'm describing those as male athletes over 40 and female athletes over 50, if they have one or more risk factors for uh, coronary artery disease, because coronary artery disease, again, is by far and away the most likely cause of sudden death, uh, they would need some further testing. Um, and the risk factors would include hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, they're a smoker, family history of early onset of coronary artery disease or a sedentary lifestyle, they should be recommended for an exercise tolerance test before participating in sport. So let's go through the 12 elements of the recommendations of the American Heart Association for screening of competitive athletes. And uh, first of all, uh, let's look at the, uh, sorry, uh, the medical history here. 
And the medical history, uh, for the older athletes, you can obtain the history from them, but for the younger athletes, they really don't know the family history. They don't really know their personal history that well, and, and it's advisable to verify it with their parents. Maybe send the parents home a questionnaire, uh, or if they can be present during the interview process to have them. <coughs> So those elements that are required in the history, to, uh, uh, obtaining a history of if they ever had exertional chest pain or chest discomfort, if they had unexplained syncope or near syncope, and not the type of you know vasovagal attack that one can normally see, but ex if especially they have exercise-induced syncope, you know if they're passing out with exercise, or if they have any other uh, other type of unexplained syncope, that that is a red flag and needs to be followed up. You know, all athletes get short of breath with exercise, but if they have a exceptional or unexplained shortness of breath or fatigue, and especially associated with exercise, uh, uh, they need to be further evaluated. Uh, if they've been pre uh, previously told of a heart murmur, that, that should be a red flag, that that needs to be followed through. And of course, if they've had a history of hypertension, uh, that needs to be followed up. As far as family history, uh, that's very important because, as I have mentioned, a number of these uh, uh, congenital heart disease are uh, familial in etiology, so they do uh, run in families. So if there is a history of premature death, sudden or unexpected, under age 50, for whatever reason, uh, they should go on to further screening. Uh, if there's been a family relative who's had disability from heart disease under 50 years old, they require further screening. And if there is specific knowledge of certain cardiac conditions in the family, such as uh, cardiomyopathy, the hypertrophic or the dilated cardiomyopathy, the um, uh, channelopathy, so it's long QT syndrome, which is electrocardiographic uh, abnormality, Marfan syndrome, or clinically important arrhythmias in the past, uh, that needs to be further pursued. As far as the examination, um, the examination requires close uh, uh, auscultation to elicit heart murmurs. And the heart murmur that one would really uh, really focus on is uh, <coughs> the murmur of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And that is a systolic murmur uh, heard best at the base of the heart. And uh, it is best heard with the patient in the sitting position or with valsalva maneuver. Now valsalva maneuver is just closing the glottis and bearing down like it's going to have a bowel movement what I tell my patients. I find the valsalva maneuver not that reliable because often they'll take a, a short breath or a deep breath and actually by taking that breath pull the chest wall away from the heart so that may muffle a heart murmur so you may not hear it increase with that maneuver. So the best thing to do is listening to the athlete in the lying and sitting position. It's very important. Uh, to uh, feel uh, the femoral pulse, and I recommend uh, simultaneous feeling the radial and femoral pulse to exclude coarctation of the aorta. Now, coarctation of the aorta is a band in the aorta um, uh, just beyond the uh, takeoff of the left subclavian that constricts blood flow below uh, that area uh, to the um, you know, the abdominal blood vessels and to the lower extremities and can be a cause of hypertension. It is a congenital abnormality. And it is very important, just a simple examination uh, finding, of if you feel that, that the uh, radial and femoral pulse are, are beating almost simultaneously, there's usually a slight delay of the femoral pulse, uh, that's okay. But if there is a significant delay uh, in feeling the femoral pulse, that could be a tip off that uh, one is dealing with coarctation. Also, one would expect the femoral pulse might be diminished. The physical stigmata of Marfan syndrome, I'll show you in a slide, and then be sure if, uh, a break of arterial pressure is performed at least in the sitting position and preferably taken in both arms. So this is a slide of, uh, of, a, of uh, a patient with Marfan syndrome. Um, and the, the point that you uh, take out here are the fact that uh, the, the, the fingers are very long, arachnidactly. You know, they're very tall, thin uh, patients. They may have pectus excavatum, this pointed chest. Uh, there, uh, there is something called the wrist sign where because their fingers are so long, 
if they wrap their finger, uh, their hand around their wrist, the thumb will overlap their overlap their index finger. And if they close, this is the thumb side. They close their wrist and and put their uh, thumb in their um, in their hand. The thumb will out, you know uh, protrude out uh, beyond the fifth digit. So these are signs. There's also a a measurement called. Uh, uh, wingspan, wingspan versus height, and uh, some uh, have recommended that as being a uh, sign of a possible Marfan. Now, um, I looked at at one of the NBA combines, uh, 80 athletes coming through, you know, for the pre-draft physicals, and I actually I did a ratio of wingspan over height. Now, wingspan is supposed to be less than height, and 40% of those athletes Winston was greater than, than the height. So when these tall uh, uh, basketball players, uh, it really doesn't hold up as being, a, as being an accurate physical finding. Beyond some of the basic elements, I think is very important is, uh, is uh, listening to history of drug use. Um, you know, they, it is very important because of, you know the use of cocaine, the use of uh, anabolic steroids can affect the heart. Cocaine can, how it works, uh, can adversely affect the heart. It causes coronary vasospasm. And it can cause vasospasm in large vessels or small, tiny vessels. And in large vessels, it can uh, cause uh, a symptom, essentially, of, uh, of uh, a major heart attack. And, it, and a, a good example of that, of course, is another Celtics player, uh, Lenny Bias who, the day of the draft, went out and, of course, he did a, and did a cocaine binge and he ended up dead that night after the draft, uh, after he was drafted by the Celtics. And it was, and it was most likely secondary to coronary basis thousand one of the main epicardial coronary arteries, pr producing reduced blood flow and essentially a massive heart attack. But chronic cocaine use can also uh, cause spasm within the microvasculature, and actually one can pick off heart muscle a little bit at the time and uh, cause um, uh, weakened heart or cardiomyopathy. So cocaine is, can be a real issue. And I find that even at the professional level that, um, you know, a lot of these athletes have come from poor areas where there's a lot of drug abuse and they have a lot of friends who are still, uh, still uh, working in that environment and sometimes they get exposed to these drugs and, you know, we have to be very cautious about screening them uh, and making sure that they understand uh, the ramifications of that type of drug abuse. Uh, nutrition history, I think, is really important, especially in females. Um, if, if they have excessive weight loss, self-induced vomiting, amenorrhea, anemia, osteoporosis, it's all, that's all very important. I can think back of when I was asked in our uh, ambulatory care unit, which are essentially our, our emergency room, New England Baptist Hospital, I was asked to see an athlete from Duke University. She was a runner. And uh, she was seeing a hematologist because of anemia, and I was asked to see her because of premature ventricular contractions. But in getting into her history, she was a she was a very compulsive runner, and had had significant weight loss. She was running at least 10 miles a day, and a little bit of further history gathering, she had amenorrhea, you know, no periods for quite a while. And so that was the anemia. We ordered a bone uh, uh, scan, um, actually a bone density. And although she was not osteoporotic, uh, uh, she was osteopenic, meaning that her bone density was down. This was a 20-year-old athlete. We alerted her um, uh, trainers and coaches at, at Duke University, and they watched her. And a year later, I got a call back where that the athlete did not turn around her eating habits or her exercise program. Unfortunately, she, she continued with this female trial of um, of amenorrhea, anemia, and osteopenia, and um, they had to ask her to leave school and seek help. So, limitations for pre participation screening. Um, this is an interesting study that was done by Barry Naren and reported in 1996, where he evaluated 134 athletes that died and looked at what. What, um, how good was the pre-participation screening exam? Well, it turns out that uh, four athletes out of the 134 had no evaluation. But the 130 athletes did have an evaluation. 
And uh, of those, 115 had the standard screening and 15 had a cardiovascular screening. And of those, uh, you know, about 19 had evidence of heart disease, uh, eight had a correct diagnosis, only two were disqualified from participating in sport. And unfortunately, here is 144 athletes who died. So I think the takeaway on this slide is, number one, maybe the uh, screening at that time was not very good. But I think more importantly is, it is almost impossible to screen all the time for these athletes. And you always have to have a high awareness that an athlete can have underlying uh, undiagnosed heart disease, even as they are participating. So that, that takes you to, okay, the athletes made it, to the, um, made it through their pre-participating exam, and then, and then the question is, what do you do when your athlete comes to you with symptoms? And uh, the red flags and symptoms, if you think of the cardiac history, is uh, if they're, again, having episodes of chest pain or chest tightness, uh, especially with exercise, if they have unusual shortness of breath, unexplained shortness of breath, their exercise tolerance goes down, if they're getting lightheadedness or uh, have unexplained syncope, those should be all red flags, and I would encourage you to understand that they may in fact have underlying heart disease and, and you have to say that until proven otherwise these athletes are ineligible to play and need to be referred to further evaluation. So when we look at the uh, eligibility to uh, competition and cardiac evaluation, let's say these athletes are either screened uh, and have an abnormality that you're concerned about or they have symptoms uh, related to their participation in sport, they need to be referred uh, for a cardiac evaluation and should be by a consultant that's specially trained in, in evaluating athletes. And it requires a complete history, uh, family history, you know, history of illicit drug use, uh, use uh, physical examination, and, and, and initial evaluation will always require an electrocardiogram. Now, what I have here is an algorithm of, of how to approach the uh, patient as determination of eligibility. And if, if as I said, the uh, history is abnormal, uh, again, they need to be for it. Something in the examination is abnormal, they need to be for it. If they have symptoms, they need to be for it. Or if they have an abnormal EKG, they need to be for it. And I put this EKG up on the slide uh, in that the United States does not require an EKG as, a, as part of the pre-participation physical examination. Most countries in Europe require it. Uh, there is good evidence that requiring the pre-participation examination can identify athletes with underlying heart disease before they participate. And I think that the Italian group has definitely shown that in the long run, they can reduce the incidence of sudden death by, by, by uh, using this algorithm of, of, of um, you know, a solid history, solid examination, and a review of the EKG. The argument in this country is, is that obtaining EKGs is very expensive. There's going to be a lot of abnormal EKGs, especially in athletes, as I'll show you later. And a lot of athletes are going to go through an unnecessary, unnecessary expensive testing. So this, this uh, argument goes on. So anyway, uh, an athlete will be referred for cardiac testing if there's any abnormality. And we have at our, you know, at our regimen here is a number of tests that we do. As you mentioned, the EKG. We can do an event monitor or a Holton monitor. An event monitor is a monitor an athlete can wear for a month uh, to evaluate for a regular heartbeat. An echocardiogram also also sound heart, which is diagnostic for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but can help in other areas like dilated aortic root and Marfan syndrome, uh, mitral valve prolapse, and valvular heart disease. It's, it's a plus minus screen for arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, it's a terrible screen for anomalous coronary artery. Uh, stress testing is a, a good test for screening athletes, especially if they're having symptoms with exercise. And what I like to use is a stress echocardiogram that combines the echocardiogram, so you get a structural look at the heart, and then a physiological look at the heart with um, exercise. So a stress echocardiogram, an echocardiogram performed prior to exercise, 
patient is exercised just like a regular stress test with a 12 lead EKG. And as soon as they stop exercise, we stop the treadmill abruptly. They get back down the examination table and we look at the heart and wall motion post-exercise. If we're trying to screen for coronary artery disease or um, anomalous coronary artery, a nuclear scan, a stress nuclear scan can be helpful. Uh, cardiac MRI is going to be very helpful in a rhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia that is actually diagnostic for it. And if I have any concerns or questions about uh, athletes who have arrhythmias, especially ventricular arrhythmias, and I want to exclude it, uh, cardiac MRI. I recently was referred um, within the past year and a half an athlete from uh, from Northeastern University. There was a young woman who said, you know, my exercise tolerance is going down. I'm just getting short of breath with less exercise. And we did a, a cardiac echo. And the only abnormality on that echo was that the right ventricle was slightly enlarged. And so I sent her, and she had no evidence of a, like an atrial septal defect that shunt in the heart that I could see, at least between the septum and at the atrial and ventricular level, but still was suspicious there was something uh, wrong. And we referred it for a cardiac MRI. In fact, she turned out to have a, a left to right shunt. She had an unusual finding of having a anomalous pulmonary vein. Now, if you look at the uh, anatomy of the, of the blood flow to the lung, you have the pulmonary artery pumping blood flow to the lung, and then the, uh, there are four pulmonary veins draining the lung and, and uh, draining into the left atrium, and they drain oxygenated blood. And uh, one of those four veins was draining blood uh, back to the uh, superior vena cava, so it's chunking oxygenated blood back to the right side of the heart and requiring, it was uh, producing increased blood flow. This probably would not be a cause of sudden death in, that, in this athlete, but it would definitely over time uh, cause you know, pulmonary hypertension and, and, and real limitation <coughs> of her lifespan if it wasn't uh, diagnosed and addressed. And so she, between, in the month of May after she finished her semester, was able to undergo heart surgery and have that corrected. Then finally, in, in certain circumstances, uh, cardiac catheterization was advised. And, and for example, in the Reggie Lewis case, uh, he did undergo cardiac catheterization. So let's talk about, um, you know, uh, athletes in their heart. Athletes can have very abnormal looking hearts, and this is an electrocardiogram, and this is a very abnormal electrocardiogram. This is a professional basketball player who's approximately 27 years old. He's absolutely fit, and all this cardiac workup is totally negative. And they, is, this is sort of typical for an athlete's heart in that they can have no heart disease but abnormal EKG. And what we're seeing here are the, this is the T wave, QRS, and T wave, and these T waves here are inverted in the inferior leads. And these bizarre looking ST elevations almost look like they're having a heart attack. And they're looking at the feeling fine and go out and play a full game of basketball. And here there are T wave abnormalities. And so they can have all kinds of EKG abnormalities. They can have uh, first degree AV block, they can have uh, second degree AV block, meaning the conduction between the atrium and the ventricle, ventricle is slowed. Uh, they can have atrial arrhythmias and trichlor arrhythmias. Um, if one questions whether this is real heart disease or not, and is not convinced through the cardiac testing that that um, that uh, they have or have not uh, do not have cardiac disease, one could uh, have them deconditioned for a while to see if some of these abnormalities improve. This is uh, an electrocardiogram of an athlete uh, uh, with WPW. And you know, what it is is uh, a pre-excitation pre that instead of having one electrical fiber coming down from the upper chamber of the heart to the lower chamber of the heart, they have two. And so they get conduction through the normal pathway and then short conduction through the other <coughs> pathway. And they can be set up for um, re-entering arrhythmias. Uh, the, the electrical circuit goes around in the loop. Uh, it is dangerous if they have associated atrial fibrillation because that means their heart rate can go at 300 and, and the heart and ventricle does not have time to fill and they could die suddenly uh, of, of uh, re-entrant uh, atrial fibrillation. This is an athlete who came to me as a bicyclist, a, a very uh, competitive bicyclist who, who told me that during exercise, maybe 20 or 30 minutes into his uh, competitive cycling, he was getting palpitations. So I put him on a treadmill, 
And here's, um, you know, as he's getting up in his heart rate, and his heart rate here is about 125. You can see these wide complex tachycardia here, sort of uh, monomorphic ventricular tachycardia here. And here he is off on total ventricular tachycardia, saying, geez, I feel lightheaded, but he didn't pass out on me. <laughs> and uh, did not have to use paddles or anything to bring him back. And actually, when he stopped, it resolved. And um, it's a scary thing when you see it, but uh, it turns out that on the further studies, the further evaluation, he had a right ventricular outflow tract tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia comes from the right ventricular outflow tract, which is actually a pretty easy thing to cure. Um, we uh, set him up and he had an ablation procedure at uh, Baptistral Deaconess. Uh, we were able to slide a little wire up onto the right side of the heart map where this um, uh, short circuit uh, bypass track was, uh, delivers our radial frequency ablation, which is very low energy ablation procedure, uh, causing a little bit of scar tissue, interrupting that track. And I've been following him now more than 10 years after this event and it has not recurred. And he's back cycling, he's back competitively cycling. This is um, just a demonstrate what we see on echocardiography. You saw the cross-section of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and this is the equivalent of that cross-section section of a patient with uh, an athlete of mine who is actually um, in college was uh, found to have a heart murmur. He was a goalie on a, uh, a Division I school, and um, unfortunately he was determined to be ineligible based on this. Uh, he was on a full scholarship, and actually, the college did recognize his four, four years of scholarship, which was nice. But here is his uh, hypertrophy uh, interventricular septum here, uh, and uh, you can see it here. It's, it's, the, the wall is very thick, and it's compared to the lateral wall. This is using Doppler looking at just under the aortic valve that there is a gradient. In other words, this is about 100 millimeter gradient. The, the ventricle for example, would generate a, blood, a pressure inside the ventricle of 200 to obtain a systolic blood pressure of 100 because of the obstruction in the outflow tract in these patients. And this is a, just an MO study showing that the tear, that the mitral valve just pulls up against the septum and everything kind of obstructs the outflow uh, of the uh, blood from the ventricle uh, at, you know, uh, during exercise. One of the uh, other uh, things that, uh, that we um, have difficulty with in evaluating athletes is uh, what we call overlap in gray areas because some heart disease um, uh, can, can look like, um, I'm sorry, some athletic hearts can look like they have heart disease. In that, for example, uh, a dilated cardiomyopathy, well, if you look at the upper limit to normal of the ventricle is 57, are 56 here millimeters, and sometimes in a very dilated ventricle we get up to 70 millimeters. But very many of the selfish basketball players uh, have ventral uh, cavity dimensions about uh, 60 millimeters and 65 millimeters. So that's a normal adjustment for the aerobic exercise. They also get less ventricular hypertrophy, so their wall, uh, heart muscle wall, is a little bit thickened. Uh, so again, this can be, these are we know are normal athletes without any heart, underlying heart disease, but they can fall in the gray area. They can have really bizarre looking EKGs, and um, they can have sometimes even arrhythmias uh, that, can, that can be of concern, but again, um, uh, usually turn out uh, not to be of a, a, a clinical significance. So we've talked about cardiac testing, and um, so the athlete goes through the cardiac testing, and then if, if the cardiac testing determines that there's no structural heart disease, there's no electrical abnormalities, uh, that everything's okay, we can uh, return them to play. But what about if uh, things turn out abnormal? What do we do then? Well, then we resort to what's called the Bethesda guidelines. And there are specific guidelines, like our Bible, uh, uh, which uh, goes over uh, recommendations. And uh, the most recent guidelines were published in 2005 in the Journal American uh, College of Cardiology. And it goes over the eligibility recommendations for competitive athletes with cardiovascular abnormalities. And it's very, it's very specific. Um, 
they go through the types of exercise, uh, <coughs> static versus dynamic, and, and make guidance as far as acceptable cardiac risk. So just to review, uh, again, static exercise uh, being uh, uh, athletes uh, who uh, do weightlifting, so there's little muscle and joint movement and large intramuscular force, and dynamic exercise, where such as long distance riders who have large muscle and joint movement. And force down into these different So at the low dynamic uh, and the low static end of things, you know, essentially walking, you know, golfing, rifle, cricket, bowling, billiards, okay? At the high dynamic end, we're getting into long distance running, the cross country skiing, racquetball, squash. And then the high dynamic is going to be the weightlifting, where it's with, uh, windsurfing, um, certain giant, uh, uh, gymnastic events. And then uh, way out here, as far as the combination of extreme dynamic and uh, static competition, you know, with boxing, canoeing, kayaking, cycling, decathlon, speed skating, triathlon. So they actually break this down to give us guidelines based on the underlying heart disease. So if we look at examples of, of what a recommendation would be, let's say somebody has asymptomatic aortic stenosis. And the question is, are they eligible to return to sport or are they not? We go to the guidelines and they tell us the following, that if the athlete is asymptomatic and has mild aortic stenosis, they are eligible to return to sport without restriction. However, if they are moderate or severe aortic stenosis, they would be considered independent eligible to return to competitive sport. Uh, myocarditis. Uh, myocarditis is an inflation inflammation of the heart muscle. It uh, usually is a viral illness. Uh, you may see this uh, in your career happening quite often. And if an athlete has myocarditis, it means that the heart muscle has been inflamed and may be unstable, and they're usually associated with some weakness to the heart muscle. So that theory has to be considered ineligible, and you have to give the heart six months to recover. And that in order for them to return to play, the guidelines recommend that they have to have a stress test, either a stress echo or a stress nuclear study. And a, and a return of, you have to document that your left ventricular systolic function returns to normal. And that during exercise and during monitoring, they have no evidence of significant arrhythmia. So again, going through our algorithm here, we're getting down to the the guidelines, and the question is, uh, you know, if by the Bethesda guidelines, if they feel that they can return to play, they, you know, they, they are eligible to return, but they can be uh, ineligible as a temporary thing, as I mentioned in myocarditis or permanent things, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a more detailed outline of the algorithm. I'll go through that probably in here. So, one thing that we have to say, and I think, well, anybody who takes care of athletes, what to do with high profile cases, because they can be a lot of strain and stress and, uh, on, on the medical team and, um, and on, on the um, athletic team. Uh, number one is the athletes with symptoms need to have a complete cardiac evaluation, number one. Uh, the medical evaluation should be free of outside pressure. And the pressure comes from, um, could be from uh, family, uh, can be from, uh, can be sometimes from coaches, it can be from the media, especially if it's very high profile, media get involved. Um, you have to maintain trust and communication with the patient and their family. It's very important. Once you lose your trust, you're definitely going to go elsewhere and get recommendations elsewhere. I have to follow the eligibility guidelines and stick to them because they will protect you. And so sticking to your decision and not being, um, um, you know, uh, have your decision change because uh, it may interfere with the career of an athlete and college athlete. A lot of these athletes may want to go on to play professional sports and if you have, you know, if you decide that they're ineligible for any reason, they could destroy their, their plans for uh, a career in, in, in um, a professional sport. Um, and also, again, the press just can be all over you on this information. 
So back to Thomas Perry, and unfortunately, um, he, uh, as we said, died after a game. His coronary support uh, uh, stated that he had a diseased right coronary artery and scar tissue, maybe as having a prior infarct. I, heard, uh, I had a conversation from uh, some of the people on, on the inside that he may have had, in fact, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I think this is a, I'd like to just sort of point out the difference between the national football uh, association, National Basketball Association of the NFL and the N NBA, in that uh, the NBA now, uh, I have been for years uh, requiring all athletes every year to have a stress echocardiogram before they can participate, even if they had them the year before. And it's been a good screen to make sure that athletes are are eligible to return to play. And I have <coughs> on occasion picked up some things that we've been able to treat and get them back into competition. But the NFL only screens about 20% of their players pre preseason, you know, and so that this may not be adequate when you're dealing with at this level of competition. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, uh, this is Fred Hoiberg, who on, who had to undergo heart surgery for a congenital pie valve that was missed uh, because his team uh, was not following him, even though he knew he had a bicuspid aortic valve was documented in college and at the NBA combine the draft, and then it was monetized by his previous teams, the Pacers and Bulls, but not monitored by the Timberwolves. And so he got himself in a bit of trouble with uh, uh, severe aortic stenosis and had to have surgery, but was able to return to competition after the valve replacement. So let's move on. We talked about, you know, we talked about pre-screening, we talked about, you know, athletes with symptoms, but again, we're not going to find everybody out there who has heart disease. And, and the important thing is to talk about defibrillators. And it's something that I'm very passionate about. Um, defibrillators can mean saving somebody's life. And time is survival when defibrillation is sudden death. So that for every one minute, of delay of use of the defibrillator, there's a, a 7 to 10% reduced chance of survival. So the quicker one can get a defibrillator on, the more likely there's the chance of survival. And so I strongly encourage immediate access. If I look at, look at the slide here, you know, this is a, a Hank Gathers being carried off the court, and you can see he was in full cardiac arrest. The sad thing is, Here's the defibrillator. And if he had been left on the floor, attended to, defibrillated, he would have probably had a better chance than, than he would have, than he did have, by going back into the locker room and full cardiac arrest, maybe a couple of minutes later, applying a defibrillator and unable to be resuscitated. This is um, just a, uh, a um, recording from an internal uh, defibrillator, just showing an event in a, in a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And here you can see uh, ventricular fibrillation that's being recorded by the internal mechanism in the defibrillator. It recognizes the charge of shock and brings the patient right back to sinus rhythm. So again, defibrillators are life-saving. Just moving on then, uh, because this is more uh, information related to sudden death, but also ties in the use of defibrillators. Let's talk about commotio cordis, which means it's a Latin term for commotion of the heart. And this is, is uh, blunt chest trauma leading to cardiac arrest. It is not cardiac contusion. Cardiac contusion means there's an actual injury to the heart. The heart actually gets injured. The heart muscle gets injured, and actually, you can, when you, if you do blood tests, you can see muscle enzymes being leaked into the blood. That's contusion. Commotio cordis is not, uh, it's not a heart muscle injury itself, but it's a blunt trauma of the chest that sets off an abnormal heartbeat, ventricular fibrillation. And this is, uh, this is actually a slide from a video taken uh, during a karate match. And uh, this uh, shows uh, unprotected precordial uh, hit. And you can see the athlete on our right here uh, hitting right in the precordium of the chest and making a solid blow. And that's an area where they score high points for, so in the scoring system. And this was an unprotected chest. Here's the athlete going down, using cardiac arrest, and unfortunately dying. Okay. 
So where do these events occur? Uh, they occur in different forms, uh, usually where there's uh, bodily contact with either projectiles or bodily contact. So they most likely occur in baseball, softball, ice hockey, football, soccer, and then, you know, there's some background uh, with lacrosse, karate, and boxing. Again, it, it, part of this is related to the, the uh, number of participants in the sport, where, you know, baseball does have a lot of athletes participating, especially young athletes. And this is a, another study uh, that was done by Barry Marin, where uh, he looked at uh, 22 consecutive cases of commotio cordis. And at autopsy, they looked at where the site of trauma was on the chest. And you can see all the events are pretty much in the pre -boarding. And he looked at base, you can see how he broke down baseball, just pretty much all over the floor, ice hockey, right over the heart, the cross ball, right here over the heart, and the knee. Um, you know, just, just below where the heart is. And it, um, it can, as I mentioned, be related to recording impact of a projectile. Most of the time, that's hit from baseball, softball, hockey, hockey puck, and lacrosse ball, or more extensive bodily contact, such as a football helmet, hockey stick, karate kick, or bodily collision between two players. And uh, how does it happen? Well, again, we talked about location and recording. Time is, is, is amazing. It has to be time, you know, at, at the very vulnerable period. And here is a, a, a cartoon of an EKG, and here is the P wave, the atrial electric, uh, electrical activity, the QRS complex, the ventricular electrical <coughs> activity, and then the repolarization phase, the T wave. And in this this vulnerable period, a very short period, between 15 and 30 milliseconds prior to the peak of the T wave, if, 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 they, if, it, if an athlete gets a uh, blow in the chest at that particular time, put them at risk for uh, sudden death. So it can occur at a low energy, uh, but, you know, even at 30 miles per hour. It usually occurs in younger athletes, and the reason why is because their chest uh, wall is more cartilage than it is bone, and it's more pliable and so probably allowing uh, more compression against the heart. And of course, the harder the projectile, the more likely it is to occur. And Dr. Link from New England Medical Center did this great study looking at uh, swine, and he, he had it set up where it, uh, he had uh, a swine heart where he could, uh, a live swine would be able to project uh, baseball at the heart and, and evaluate uh, evaluate exactly when this event would occur, and this is really the first time this was ever documented. And you can see this is you know, a slide from this experiment right at the T way. The, the slide goes right into uh, ventricular fibrillation. And he showed that the, uh, the, the higher the projectile force, uh, the more likely it's to occur, the softer the baseball, the less likely it's Uh, this is an interesting slide that was published in the New England Journal. This is a, um, a um, baseball player, he was a little leaguer, under 12 years old, who went down getting hit in the chest with a baseball. Luckily, there was a police car with a defibrillator <coughs> nearby. And this is the recording from the defibrillator where you can see that, you know, this, this athlete was in particular fibrillation. You can see the, there was a charge here, shock, and the athlete came back and was resuscitated back into sinus rhythm. So this is a survivor, and this is, you know, a great case to show that time is just of the essence. These things are unpredictable, and having this fibrillator nearby is really important. So, um, you know, as far as uh, commotion cord, it's very important to remember uh, prevention. And prevention is in padding. Having proper padding is very important. And if you're dealing with younger athletes, Ear on the side of a softer, softer baseball, especially in the younger athletes if they're playing baseball, the softer ball would reduce the risk. And you know, try not to have them swinging the bats and hitting balls right on top of one, one another. I remember when I was playing baseball, it would be always used to do pepper. One, you know, and that was a game where you just hit the ball like this right at each other and you're about two feet apart. Well, that's that's you can't do that anymore. I mean, it's just too risky. Um, and again, remember the treatment is defibrillation. Um, just for example, at the, at the Celtics, we have a uh, defibrillator at the, at the training facility. We have a, 
the triplayer, the team has uh, the team um, um, has a defibrillator right on under the bench on the floor, and there's an extra defibrillator that that, that moves the physical trainer. So we always have a defibrillator available. And, and, at, and again, at the um, Bank North Garden, there are actually ambulances under the stadium, and uh, the uh, paramedics are there with defibrillators, and really also to help if there's an athlete that goes down, but really if there's a non-athlete, the spectator goes down. So the takeaways of this talk, and um, just a few takeaways that I hope I, hope I can I emphasize. Is one is don't judge a book by its cover. Athletes look healthy. No way they can have heart disease. Well, the, well, the fact is they can have heart disease. And you have to be suspicious. You have to perform a very comprehensive and complete evaluation without any shortcuts and, and demand it of your medical team. Uh, refer any athletes with symptoms. If you're unsure, just pull the athlete out and just refer it and let somebody else try to decide if they're okay to return to the sport. Uh, insist on adequate security of protective gear and, and, and definitely have it to your body. So I thank you for inviting me. And if we have time, I, I will take some questions, but I think we're running a little over time. I apologize if I took some more time. Thank you.